Welcome and thank you for joining us for the first webinar of our Spotlight series on bringing digital HR to life. My name is Michał Sieradzki and I'm going to be your host for this session. Today's session will be divided into three parts. Holger Lips will be speaking about the HR operating model. Claudia Krumenerl will cover emotional intelligence, the essential skill set of the age of AI. And Rosemary Maguire will wrap up the session up uh, with uh, HR trends in the future post COVID. We highly recommend that you call into this webinar from your mobile using local numbers provided. For best experience, please also close all your other applications for duration of this webinar. This webinar will take approximately one hour, including a short Q&A session after each topic. Since everyone on this call has been muted, please type your questions into your GoToWebinar control panel and we will bring them up during the Q&A session. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to our presenter, Holger. Thank you very much, Michael. Hello and a warm welcome from my side as well. So my name is Holger Lips. I'm Vice President at Capgemini and Ben for Digital HR and I'm based in Germany. Just a short introduction. I have a history um, of more than 20 years in consulting, most of that with Capgemini. And my consulting focus, especially helping large companies uh, digitalizing their HR function, and that is finding the strategy, um, doing the business case for the uh, digitalization, doing the preparation, the readiness phase, and finally also doing the HR transformation during the implementation of most of the time new tools, cloud-based tools. So today I will talk about the so-called HR operating model. Well, what's that? I will come to details more later, but in short, an HR operating model outlines the fundamental aspects of how HR is working, operating. Therefore, the HR operating model is really at the heart of the HR function and it determines many other important topics in HR, such as the HR organization, the HR processes, and the roles in HR. So let's dive into the topic right away. Nowadays, HR is facing a lot of challenges. And to make it even more complicated, those challenges are very often conflicting. So for instance, HR has of course the challenge to also become digital, but on the other hand, it still has to do the operations, it still has to serve business. We do see the uh, challenge that um, HR services should be standardized to drive um, consistency, to drive down costs. But on the other hand, the employees are expecting personalized delivery and services. HR needs to manage globally, but on the other hand, never um, local compliance has been more important than nowadays. So also um, a challenge. Then we also have the different generation topic. So people like I um, are, are serving um, younger people and we really have to, to solve the potential challenges and conflicts here. As we already said that we need to be people and employee focused, but on the other hand, we need to get data focused as well. Totally different. So in the end, it's really, we have challenges um, which, are, which are conflicting. We have especially the challenge to, to um, be modern, to catch up and to, to, um, to serve the business and to uh, meet the, uh, the customers, internal customers expectations. So it's not an easy time for HR, for sure. But there are more challenges out there. And one of the largest challenges we are seeing is technology. So technology is also a huge driver for the challenge and the changes in HR. So for more than 20 years, HR IT was more or less dominated by the HR modules in ERP. And there was not lot, not much uh, innovation here. But in the last few years, we really saw a flood of technology um, um, innovations uh, in HR as well. So I just want to go quickly through them. So cloud systems, almost all HR systems are now cloud systems, at least when they are offering new and, and, and innovative functionalities. And most of the, my clients are thinking about uh, implementing a cloud system, HR cloud system, or, un, or under the way to do so. 
social platforms, another one. So social platforms is now almost a given in, in companies and all employees are using them. And if you don't provide uh, employees a social platform, they will use WhatsApp. So social platforms are really driving behavior also um, in, uh, within people and in collaboration with HR. Analytics, I mentioned that uh, um, previously. So analytics is on the rise in HR as well. So you want to have statistical models to predict how workforces will behave, to understand um, where cost in HR is and so forth. And last but not least, artificial intelligence. To my understanding, still on the rise, but if artificial uh, intelligence really hits HR and is able to solve um, new problems without being really being programmed for it, it will also cause a huge change. And of course, all these um, IT innovations in HR it are giving HR great opportunities. But on the other hand, they are changing by using them uh, the way HR is working, the way of working in HR. And that also has a big impact on the so-called operating model. But there's something else, uh, something else which we all together went through in the last weeks and months, the COVID-19 crisis. I had a customer on the phone last week and uh, she asked me, Olga, do you see any impact of the COVID-19 crisis um, on, on HR? And yes, of course, there is a significant impact here. So HR understood that it was not really prepared for a crisis. So HR has to become more crisis resistant and has to acquire crisis management capabilities. Of course, there will be also the need to increase the flexibility in the workforce, to upscale, downscale the workforce, to go to virtual ways of working um, and to have additional capabilities. We do see also the need to reinforce the usage of HR analytics and reporting because um, executives want to understand where is their workforce, what are they doing, how much is in home office, how much are already back in offices and things like that. And of course, HR itself as a function needs to be more crisis proven and that pays also into the operating model. So all these developments together, the HR challenges, the technology innovations, the COVID-19 crisis, they are all accelerating the change in HR and they are challenging the way of working in HR changing it and challenging the operating model of many companies. Okay, but what is this HR operating model at most of the companies? So most of the large companies, um, at least I'm working with, do still have the so-called Dave Ulrich model. The Dave Ulrich model is named after Professor Dave Ulrich and he invented this model back in 1997, so quite some time ago. And he said it has been really adopted by many companies, especially the large ones. There are some flavors to it, but it's more or less always the same. So what do we have? Just in short, I'm sure you know it. COEs, the centers of ex uh, expertise, they are really the ones where the few real experts are located. So the recruiting expert, the, the development expert, things like that. HR business partners, so they are the partners of the business and they are the ones the business speaks to, um, gives um, the demand to, the one who organizes the solutions and serves the business. And of course, the HR shared service center, um, those people who are working in a more factory-like approach, um, in a more streamlined approach to do the commodity type of work. So that's the model and um, it has been here for 20 years and there are some flavors, as I said, but it's more or less um, the same over every, everywhere. So now let's dive a little bit deeper into um, the specifics of and characteristics of this model. Here we have it. So when we look at the HR operating model, Dave Ulrich, we see that it's more or less an HR for HR model. So it's a model how HR can uh, organize its work, its service to the business. It has isolated roles, three building blocks, 
they are stable, they are bold, and you can call them even silos. And behind all the models stands the philosophy HR is a service that has a delivery functions, function. It has a high focus on administration and even on controlling the employees, controlling the managers. I do remember times when my HR called me up and said, Olga, have you done the target agreements with all your employees? Oh no, there's one left, you have to do it, that's the deadline, things like that. So when we go back to what we just said before, so HR consumers, um, they, they are not really the, the primary focus of this model. This, the primary focus of this model is HR itself. Um, we do not have um, the, the, the ability with this model to serve fast changing business needs. Like now, uh, we need to scale down, we need to scale up, we um, need to focus on this country or that country. So it's not, it's not supported by this model. And of course, also not all the new functionalities and capabilities provided by those uh, fascinating new technology tools are reflected in this operating model. So what do we need for the future? We need a kind of a HR for business model. We need an agile cross-functional model, so which, which, which can scale that up and down, which can, can, can um, put the focus on different areas and really respond to the business needs. We need HR not as a kind of a supervisor, but as a coach, as an advisor, yeah, for employees, maybe even a field manager. And we have to have also this one touch, you know, this Amazon-like feeling. So whatever request I have, I'm as a, as a person with, with a team responsibility, a personal request or a team request, I always only go to one, one contact. So in the end, HR needs to become uh, a driver for the development of the business. But what is the future HR operating model to support that, to fulfill all of its requirements? Well, the answer is very interesting because there is not such thing as the HR operating model of the future. The fascinating thing is that there are many out there and that you have to choose or even have to decide your own. I will now dive into uh, some of those um, operating models just to give you an impression, a feeling, what is um, out there. First of all, let's have a look at startups. So startups are very often an inspiration for large grown-up companies. And when we look at the HR operating model, yes, for sure, Sure, they are disruptive in this area as well. So what you come across first is you see a heavy use of automation and IT technology in HR. Then it's obvious those companies do not have at all the HR or Dave Ulrich model. They don't have the specialists, the split between business partner, um, shared services, COEs, but they have HR generalists which can do everything and which can switch in an agile way from doing one task to a completely different task. And then there's, of course, a huge emphasis on culture in those, those companies. Open, continuous feedback, flag hierarchies, and also very often minimal standardization um, with regarding uh, to such topics as uh, compensation and benefits. But above all, communication is important. So everybody talks to everybody. Um, the, the, the internship talk, talks to the COE, and uh, sorry, to the CEO. And um, by this way, um, the, the boundaries between the employees, the managers, and HR are blurred. So completely different operating model, how to do HR at startups. So when those startups have been grown up, and some of the startups have been grown up for sure, most of the time into large tech companies, you might ask yourself, have they changed their operating model? And yes, they have. So first thing you come across again is they are using technology even more. They're using technology as much as possible. 
and their often data-heavy um, business model has also a strong influence on, on HR. So those companies um, are often using um, data analytics uh, for HR decision-making. So where do I hire um, a certain skill? So how do I, I change um, maybe a, a pay schemes and things like that based on data analytics? We also have see the trend that they skip old fashioned or just not use or adopt old fashioned, so-called old fashioned HR methodologies, like for instance, target agreements, things like that. So I have a client who just kept all target agreements and everybody um, is uh, very much incentivized over uh, the profit of the company. So that's also something, something um, you very, you more and more come across. So it's no wonder that those companies manage HR more like a business. KPI driven, as I said, but focused on profit and loss. And to be honest, they are not the people caretaker. And this is not the old happy uh, HR people function we are all used to. So it's, it's really different and new. And here's another model. So we have a, a, here a model which um, puts also a lot of emphasis on value added services, really driven by the demand of the business, being flexible, organized like a profit center. Um, in this model, you have a um, small, capabil small capability group, which comes in three flavors, HR consulting. So the people from HR going out to the business and um, consulting the business. And so, for instance, coming to me and say, hey, Holger, um, you know, um, you want to grow um, your, your team and we have great ideas um, for, for, for recruiting, for instance. Data analytics, so people coming to me and telling me, well, Holger, um, hiring, um, I'm based in Germany, as I said, hiring in the South is expensive, but why do we not hire more in, in the North? So we have done a great analysis, which shows that there are good people available, but not so expensive like in the South. So we have a strategy for you. And of course, change and transformation because change and transformation is something we do every day and and HR is definitely expected to support that. Of course, also in this model, um, use of technology and automation is maximized. And um, of course, also in this model, data analytics, you see it's a trend, uh, is also very much used. Interestingly, um, this model uh, is um, used in a, in a company um, which has uh, different business lines. And every base line of business has an operational workforce manager. And this um, person, he or she, is responsible for hiring, staffing, development, and so forth in the, in the business function itself, which organizes uh, those services. And HR is rather small, slim here in this model. And uh, if HR needs more capacity due to big business um, um, requests, uh, projects, or even, or even it might transform further itself, then um, this, uh, this model relies on external experts which are hired uh, for a time um, period to, to support. So my next model, another example, has been uh, developed uh, with a client and is from my point of view kind of a um, intermediate state because it's a big company, currently in, in the journey of digitalization, which will for sure uh, take some years. So in this model, HR efficiency is one of the most important topics. So huge emphasis on synergies, um, lean processes um, throughout the globe, throughout the biz, different businesses as much as possible. So also a global HR governance is placed, so ensuring as much as possible that everybody is uh, working in a, in a consistent way. And of course, uh, beneath that, the experts who are still divided in, 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 in different, let's say, um, those, those, those silos, like in Dave Ulrich, but they are trying to bridge that by uh, working in an agile way and trying out to be more agile and, and, and uh, working in a, in a project and uh, a based way. 
HR operational excellence is a big topic for sure because of efficiency. So this client tries to op optimize his, his, um, his shared service center. It tries to um, drive down costs and uh, drive up automation. But on the other hand, HR very much tries to follow the business, is, is close to the business, um, is really um, putting a heavy effort into understanding the needs of the business to create a higher strategic impact for the business. And last but not least, also to be uh, more uh, crisis resistant, um, they're putting, um, since the COVID-19 crisis, a lot of emphasis on state-of-the-art technologies, uh, great workplace uh, tools, and, and also uh, giving the employees the capabilities to use those tools. So just a client example. So looking back to those uh, four examples, um, what can we learn from this? What is the takeaway? What are the takeaways? So I think there are three ta key takeaways from my point of view. First of all, in the area of HR operating model, one size that not, does not fit all any longer. So that's for sure. 20 years of Dave Ulrich gone. There are different models out there and you really have to find the one that fits your company's needs the best. And you might even need to design your own um, operating model. Second thing is, there are for sure some certain elements, at least to my point of view. So business value, agility, efficiency, automation, these are uh, elements that should be reflected or should be integrated in most of the operating models, which want to be modern. And third takeaway is, your next HR operating model will most likely not be a stable one for very long, but it will, be, it will evolve over time. It just that you might need to design your next HR operating model. And here is a short summary, what, you, what do you need to do to do so? You need to understand the business for sure, its strategy and the trends in the business. So HR needs to be much more business savvy and create much more business understanding. You need to translate the business strategy into an HR strategy. What do we want to achieve within HR? Then you need to identify within this HR strategy those objectives where you really want to focus on, where you really want to excel in. Then you have to define some out of that some strategic guidelines which you, which you can use to work on to create a, a operating model. And after you have done that, you can start to implement this, this model. So currently we are helping uh, another large Nordic um, company to go exactly through that process. So we have designed those strategic guidelines and we um, have collected also as we did it um, for, for this presentation, the input and new operating models. Um, we, of course, tailor the research to the, the need of the company, um, to, to those companies who might have different, uh, similar, similar objectives in, in HR to find out what are the operating models they implemented, why did they do so, what have they been their, their ex experience with them. And then we conduct workshops. A series of workshops um, where we um, bring all people on the same page and uh, where we, where we um, get an understanding what are the key areas where we want to go and like I said uh, two minutes ago what are the key elements we want to bring in and we kind of sketch an HR operating model and for that that workshop we, we include uh, three parties HR leadership we include managers from the business but we also include customers from, of, from, from HR, of course, the employees and, and, and different levels of managers. After a series of workshops, we analyze the outcome and draft the future HR operating model. We align it also with, with other running initiatives, company, or there might be changing input. Then we have another series of, of workshops, small series of workshops, finalize um, the HR operating model, and then we go. 
So you might ask, um, is it all worth the effort? Creating this new operating model might take you some months of work. It might uh, eat up time from, from some executives. But is it worth the effort? Well, what do you get out of that? You get a clear guidance on the future way of working in, in, in HR in your company. You get a clear target picture and a governance framework. You also have a much better and future-proof definition of the product portfolio of HR. And you also have, at least on a higher level, um, of the future organizational design and the key roles in, 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 in HR. And this, as soon as you have brought it to life, should give your HR much more flexibility to respond to the business, add much more value to the business, of course, be in line with this technology development, be able to, 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 to use, leverage, and respond to, to all the great technology developments that are happening out there. And you should also be able to improve efficiency a lot. Think about automation for sure. So you're much more future proof. So as soon as you have this target operating model defined, ready, you can go the next steps, bring it to life, create a business case, do a change impact assessment to find out what do I need to change? How do I need to accompany um, this, this, this change um, with uh, change management activities focusing on the people because people are affected for sure. And you can define a roadmap. And um, of course, you should always align with, with your IT department to find out where am I really with regards to the technology I'm using, how can I align the implementation of my operating model in HR with um, the HR IT roadmap. And then it's a classic transformation. You prepare it, you execute it, and in the end, you stabilize it and get ready for further developments. So this is my presentation on the HR operating model. I know it's a little bit of an abstract topic. However, think about it. By creating an HR operating model, you lay the foundation for the future of HR. So I do hope that um, the presentation had the one or other in interesting um, topic for you. And maybe it was also a little bit of an inspiration to think about the operating model as one of the key levers to shape the future for HR. That's it for me. Back to you, Michal. Thank you. Thank you, Holger. Um, and uh, we have two minutes before Claudia goes. Hi, Claudia. So uh, we actually have uh, one question to you, Holger. Uh, yeah, for sure. And that is, uh, what would happen if a company implements a modern HR cloud system, but stays with the old operating model? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting great, question. Great Thank question. you very much. Yeah, great question. Absolutely. So, yeah, the, the answer is the answer is you will get into conflicts, and I've seen two I've seen two ways here. Either, and that's really um, uh, interesting thing, the new tools will not really be used. So, I had one one example where a client implemented a, a completely new tool set, cloud based. And the people try to work around it as much as possible using the old process and still try to use the old systems any longer. So the client switched off this, uh, those old systems. The people started to use databases or Excels. Then we, want, we have been called in and we help them to change uh, their way of working in HR, uh, in HR. And the other way you find that people try to adapt, that they try to find a compromise between your operating model and your new tools. And that's, the, that's not so bad like the first case, but um, also in this case, you will never fully leverage all those opportunities that you get from the, from, from the new technologies. You will not, for instance, make the business case and um, People are not so happy because they, they are always caught in the middle. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Holger. Um, Claudia, I will hand over the control to you now so that uh, we can continue with the second part of our um, today's uh, webinar. Yes, thank you.
And I'm going to quickly share my screen. I hope you can all see the presentation. We see it. Okay, perfect. Um, we have about 15 minutes or so to speak about emotional intelligence as a key skill. And the basis for that is the research that we have done with the Capgemini Research Institute um, early last year. Um, so I want to share some of the results with you. But um, basically, um, what is it about? It's about the increasing importance of emotional intelligence. Um, I assume most of you know or read the newspaper about what is um, there for humans to do in the future when we have increasingly automated and augmented jobs. Um, the importance of soft skills rising. And here's a few stats and facts for you to, uh, to have a look at this. So you can see that indeed um, the um, different um, sources show that uh, the in individual emotional intelligence is, is getting more and more important. Um, interesting enough, the research um, that has been done on emotional intelligence so far um, also shows that individuals with more um, emotional intelligence have a higher su success rate in their jobs. So if you look at the studies that have been done by the, by the researchers um, in the 90s and, and early uh, 2000s, this has already been found there. So it's kind of a rejuvenation of the topic of emotional intelligence in this age of the machine. Um, I want to start with actually at an older study. Um, so we've been looking at skills of the future and what's important um, since um, 2017. I think this is when the talent gap study came out. So what we did is with LinkedIn, we looked at what are the new profiles, new job profiles, new job descriptions that are coming out. And then at the same time, um, uh, did a large survey um, about what are the top skills uh, for the future. And um, already there, we could see that the soft skills are more important or increasingly uh, perceived as more important um, um, uh, in, 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 in that study. Uh, what specifically, which, which skills specifically stood out? There was um, a field of collaboration about data-driven decision-making, comfort with ambiguity and change management. So this is still very broad. Um, so what we wanted to find out with our study last year was what exactly is this emotional intelligence? How do you build it? Um, and where are companies um, on their journey to bring this kind of skill deeper in their organization? And so this is what the research is about. Um, you have the QR code to scan in um, the, or to scan the link and, and, and get the full report downloaded uh, here. We surveyed a large number of executives and also um, um, experts in the field of emotional intelligence. Um, we also um, spoke to a lot of employees, so about the double the number of employees. And what we try to make sure is we actually get executives and employees from the same organization so we could identify the top down and the bottom up view on the skills development and the importance of emotional intelligence in an organization. How do we define emotional intelligence before we go into the uh, into the results? It can be defined as the ability to understand, manage, and effectively express one's own feelings, and also um, navigate and engage with others um, on this basis. And this is not Capgemini necessarily. This is based on Daniel Goldman, so the definition of emotional intelligence. Um, we identified four categories. We presents four categories in the report, which is around, one is around the individual as such. So me as a, as a leader or me as an employee, I need to be aware of my emotions and I need to know how to manage them. So it's, it's got to do with the individual's understanding and awareness of um, these emotional um, skills. And then the other direction, the bottom two, it's about managing the relations and also the using those skills to be aware of your environment and, and, and empathize with the organization. So kind of the outward looking, how you manage and interact with others based on these emotional intelligence skills. What did we find? Um, and this is a very, very quick summary of what the report shows. Um, pretty much 
um, shows emotional intelligence as a must-have skill. Um, executives more so thought so, 75%, um, but also employees, um, non-supervisor employees, uh, to a high number, agreed that this is um, increasingly important in the next three to five years. Investments into EI trainings are still low, so you can see that on the on on the bottom right, and this might reflect what you see in your organization that. Um, typically, EI trainings and emotional intelligence trainings are, are done for top management or leadership positions or leadership roles, but less so included into the skills, cate skills catalog for, for employees. Um, additionally, um, and that is uh, uh, complementing what I just said, you could see that not only this kind of skill is lacking in the learning and development and, 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 and development um, uh, catalog of, of employees, but also in, in the hiring and also in the promotion or placement of employees. This doesn't play a big role so far. Only uh, or less than 40% than of the organizations actually include this in a decision to hire non -super, into, into non-supervisory roles. So we can say even though um, if everybody acknowledges that this is a really important skill to have, organizations train this from the top um, and this is uh, the last point that I want to make is um, around the self-motivation for these skills um, this is what we found in previous studies there's a gap between what organizations do and what employees feel um, that is important and and their willingness to move there's a general willingness to invest their time and also um, their their um, their heart into the learning of this um, but require organizations to take action. So for example, make it part of the performance management system or part of their um, placement uh, mechanisms. So how could this look in, in real life? So we, I thought um, I'll give you some top examples. I, don't, I probably don't uh, have time to go through all of these at, uh, today, but giving you some idea of how you can uh, see emotional intelligence in, in statements of our top leaders. Um, so Steve Jobs' um, reaction on, 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 um, on an insult uh, was, a, was a good example of how you uh, can display emotional intelligence. So he didn't, um, he didn't react emotionally actually, but explained the disagreement, shared his learning, and, and also um, basically acknowledged um, the other person's opinion. Um, Satya Nadella, also a high profile CEO, um, showed that learning and, 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 and reacting to criticism is important to grow and to improve. Um, and the last one, which is, a, which, is an interesting, um, which is an interesting example from a former FBI uh, kidnapping investigator, is um, about how how you can leverage emotional intelligence in, in the decision-making and also the communication style um, of, um, of, of a very untypical, untypical job profile. I wanna share with you two client examples of how you can um, train or bring this into your organization. Um, so obviously I live in Germany, my background in, in doing projects is very much so in Germany but with a global reach. So I, we worked for Siemens, where we worked with, in the beginning, similar to what our study shows, with the leaders of the organization. So in, in particular, the supply chain department or division, which is a large division of um, roughly um, 800 people. Um, and we worked with the leaders on how leadership behaviors and leadership mindset needs to change in the digital age. Now, this has been a very big discussed topic, um, and it's not just about the technology savviness, but more so about the new ways of working and a culture. So um, we, we had an online um, self-assessment for the leaders to participate in, and which was then complemented by, by a 360 degree feedback of employees. In the first wave, we really only looked at the leaders to, 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 um, uh, to assess themselves and work with their teams, with their leadership teams to change their behaviors. And those were modular workshop system, workshops that we conducted um, and tried to practice actually more so the new behaviors and get feedback. Um, in the second wave, we expanded this to all employees in the supply chain department because the hashtag digital leader is not something that is um, owned by certain 
positions in an organization, but the behavior should be uh, should be displayed in the whole organization. So this has to digital leader is something leadership for all employees and, and what are the leadership principles and behaviors every employee needs to learn. And this was very much about collaboration, um, about, it was about diversity and inclusion and agile. So those were um, three different modules that we work with the leaders and also employees to practice their own awareness of these behaviors and their mindsets that they have in the background, um, as well as um, working with their teams on this. The second example is a little bit um, out of the box. Um, so the, the study, um, Emotional Intelligence, also supported um, the gamification and experience um, learning um, to, to foster learning emotional intelligence. So I wanted to share with you how you can also train leadership skills in a different way or these new skills in a different way. Um, so basically, and I'm going to jump to the to the key point here already, what we did is to practice these new behaviors, which were very much around um, uh, faster decision making and a failure culture. Failure culture is a bad word, but a learning culture. So to learn from mistakes and appreciate that things can go wrong, not to blame somebody else, but then to learn from that. Um, we constructed challenge rooms, so or escapes rooms, basically, is the principle. So teams of, uh, of leaders or employees are, are, are put into these challenge rooms, and they have a, an experience and, a, and, and tasks and challenges to solve that all go around respect of how you communicate with each other, about collaboration, um, communicating with each, with, each, with each other about trial and error so testing which methods which which uh, which works which doesn't um, and um, collaboration in a sense you have to trust that the person executing an individual task will contribute to them being able to leave the escape room together as a team um, a very unusual and gamified um, approach and this was done for a, a fairly traditional German um, auto uh, manufacturer, um, and, and they kind of rethought about how you can learn and train these new ways of working. So those are two um, examples of, of what you could do in training emotional intelligence in, 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 in your organization. And that is pretty much the end of my presentation, my short presentation. I want to leave you with the four suggestions that we gave in the report um, of how you could in Fuse your culture and your HR processes with AI and tele emotional intelligence um, uh, lens. So um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Claudia. I think you were extremely clear in your presentation because we did not actually get any, any questions right now. But uh, if you have any, please ask. And meanwhile, we can just go over to Rosemary. And if we have time at the end, we are happy to take them. That sounds great. Let me just get my slides up here. Thank you. Yes, I just gave you uh, the control as well. Okay. And are you seeing the slides? Not yet. Okay. Bear with now me. Now we see them. Perfect. You're seeing the first slide? Yes. Yes. Great. So good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to be with you this morning. My name is Rosemary McGuire, and I am the people and organization lead here uh, based in the UK, although uh, obviously uh, North American uh, sounding the way I do. Um, so I head up our people and organization practices, of which um, Intelligent HR is one of our offerings out into the marketplace, and I lead our Intelligent HR offering globally. Um, you know, I think I, I, I would be remiss not to start this presentation by acknowledging that as HR professionals, you have certainly been faced with a lot lately. Here in Europe, if we think about Brexit and then we think about COVID, there just has been a lot going on. So um, our, uh, our thoughts are with you as you navigate these very challenging and very tough times. I've been asked this morning to talk about HR trends and the future of HR post-COVID. Um, and some of my clients are calling that the new unnormal. Um, so let's go through and, and talk a little bit about some of the trends that we're seeing and how that would affect how you're organized in HR and your service delivery. 
So I think to be really clear, um, no matter what sector that you're in, no matter what type of organization you're a part of, um, HR is at the helm to really bring to life um, its people. And what we're seeing in terms of trends and disruption on top of the obvious disruption that we're going through globally, but what we are seeing is that when our employees arrive at work, they are looking for very personalized services that, that are applicable to them. So HR is then tasked with understanding and making sure that they provide both a personalized and a digital experience. Now, Holger talked a little bit at the top of the hour in his presentation about Amazon. And, and what um, I'd like to share further and build upon that is that what we're really looking to do as employees is when we arrive at work, we want the kinds of experiences that we have as consumers. So if we're doing our banking online, we're buying online, Netflix, Amazon, our bank platforms, when we arrive at work, we don't want to then revert back to, um, to, to very clunky and, and, and systems that don't really reflect us. So personalized and digital HR means that employees will have um, consumer grade experiences at work. And those organizations that understand that and move to have enabling technology and HR providing seamless service are going to be ahead of the game. Continuous learning is absolutely um, vital in today's time. The shelf life of skills has been shortened and shortened and shortened. And so therefore, you can't really buy your way out of these challenges. You need to actually be able to make sure that your employees are on a continual learning journey and that you understand skills holistically in the workplace. So continuous learning is another very key trend. Um, you know, everything, as we just talked about, is online and available. And so when employees come to work, they want that, that feedback and, and they want transparency. The same kind of transparency that they have as consumers and in their home life. Before they buy a, ma a major purchase, most employees are doing research online and they're able to see recommendations, they're able to see ratings. Um, so that same kind of thought process that exists for us outside of work, we want when, uh, when we come into work. Very, very important. And the, the, and the next situation that comes into play that is quite a disruptor for HR is that the speed in which change happens. Employees want to be, so purpose and speed to value. Employees want to feel part of an organization that has a purpose and that is doing something in society more than just making money. And we have tons of studies that show us that employees will relate to and want to be part of a brand that has a purpose that is more and more than just the bottom line. So there is, a, there is an attachment and a sense of belonging to an organization that provides societal purpose. Then speed to value. Never before in the history of working, and I've been in the workforce for about 30 years, and, and, and am also a former CHRO, um, a global CHRO, never before has HR needed to respond quickly. What we've seen in this pandemic is that um, organizations have gone in minutes and in days to, to whole workforces working remotely and had to transform very quickly. That ability to be agile, to transform, and our speed to value is absolutely going to continue more and more as we go through rebouncing and coming back into the workplace. In order to rebound and in order to have speed to value, old fashioned ways of working and old fashioned operating models will no longer support the organization going forward. So maximizing the use of technology, whether that be the cognitive enterprise in having enterprise level workflows, whether that's RPA, or augmented intelligence, 
real-time insight to be able to make decisions quickly is going to have to be the way of the future. Those organizations that don't adopt to a digital ways of working, both from a, how they service their clients and from internally in HR, um, will we feel will be going into a bit of a doom loop, which ends up digital Darwinism, and that's a term that we are um, we think about and it's used in the marketplace. So becoming digital as an organization and becoming digital as HR absolutely vital to the survival of the firm. Employee experience is really vital in terms of uh, if you're wanting that consumer grade experience when we come back into work, um, it's, it's, it's actually putting the employee first. And we have many, many studies that show that when uh, employees are engaged and feel good about themselves at work, um, those organizations are much more productive. So moments that matter are truly memorable experiences as the employee goes through the life cycle and as they go through their journey. So the experience that they get for onboarding and joining, um, what their experiences at work are all about, and as they get promoted, all of those moments that matter um, really are what makes a difference to employees. And that's what they talk to two friends about, who talk to two friends, who talk to two friends. So it's really important for HR that you've got a, a digitally enhanced HR function, that you're providing your employees with consumer grade experiences. And as they go through their journey, through hire to retire, you're maximizing that those moments that matter through the employee life cycle happen well and, and are uh, moments that matter that employees then can talk about and feel good about. So great employee experience has to be underpinned by HR function that is digitally enabled. And, and we are seeing as we go through um, our, our journey for HR and uh, all, all of the moments that matter and how you can transform through using technology. Moving to the cloud absolutely as a as a first start on HR becoming digitalized, but it's not just moving to the cloud. It's also making sure that you have enterprise workflows that you're maximizing the use of technology so that all of those moments that matter through the entire employee life cycle are, are, are at speed, are at pace and more importantly, that you're informed. So as you go through moving your landscape to becoming digital, you then can capitalize on having insight um, and, and having decision, but that ultimate goal of intelligent HR rests around the whole HR function being cognitive, um, having the right tools to enhance your decision-making along the way and providing line management and employees with transparency and with, uh, and with uh, digital, digital insights, um, analytics, so that the in decisions are then informed by analytics and reducing subjectivity. Intelligent HR therefore takes the regular HR employee and makes takes them from good to great because they're armed with insight, real-time insight, and a digital platform. If we think a little bit about the journey that HR has been on, um, you know, we're, we, we now, most academics, and I, uh, like both myself and other academics, are, are absolutely um, talking about where we are now as the industrial, the fourth industrial revolution. We have moved from um, personnel uh, to standardized and shared service uh, to then moving to the cloud. And now where we've landed and how we're having to respond is HR has got to be uh, linked into being fluid and being intelligent. And that intelligence comes from the technology and comes from uh, systems of insight. So enterprise um, level workflows for HR, uh, a fluid workforce in today's day and age, our ability to have channels of employees, whether they be from a gig economy, whether they be contractors, whether they be fixed term contracts, whether they be full time employees, our HR organization needs to be organized and set up so that it actually can have many different channels 
uh, for the employee and also that you have understand skills and the workforce in a holistic way so that you've got clusters of capability that can be moved and shaped to where the business um, needs it. So therefore, Intelligent HR or HR 4.0 is the alignment of all of the social, mobile, analytics, the cloud, um, and org design a, so the, the, that the operating model for HR, the service delivery model, and the service delivery catalog are totally enhanced. And all of that to create really delightful experiences but it's understanding that ability of, of, of the combination of all of that will allow HR to actually understand its workforce in a very holistic way. Where work is being done, how work is being done in a very inclusive way and giving employees um, experience and moments that matter recognized and delivered almost touchlessly, almost seamlessly but it's revolutionizing how we do work and how HR thinks and rethinks about the workforce from top to bottom. All of this requires new skills. So in the past, um, Holger at the top of the hour talked about Ulrich's model from 1997, where you know it's a three stool model, uh, centers of expertise, HR, business partners, et cetera. We have way morphed very far away from that. And today's HR function, today's digitally enabled HR needs new skills and new talent like data architects, like engineering, um, absolutely a consultative mindset and consulting skills are absolutely required, coaching required. Um, cognitive skills and to being able to understand the workforce and how the workforce is organized. And then that growth mindset and analytics and data science, that is really going to be the skills that are needed for the new intelligent 4.0 HR of the future. That future already exists now for a lot of organizations. I think in the last sort of 12 to 15 years, whether it's been in the big four or with IBM before joining Capgemini, um, I would say that, that um, those gl big global firms that have transformed are already moving quite a way towards this journey. So you've got levels of clients that have moved to the cloud, whether it be success factors, Oracle Fusion, or Workday, and now are looking to enhance that with um, RPA and augmented intelligence, again, which brings the HR employees from, from literally from good to great by arming them with all of the right insights at the right time to make key decisions. And it's also that insight also then is uh, uh, transfers over to line managers. So line managers have the best insights about their people to be able to really make informed decisions. For the last 30 seconds that I've got, we'll just share some of the predictions of the future of HR, but I'd like to share with you that some of those, some of these predictions are actually happening now. You know that we have um, natural language, voice enabled mobile apps through either Success Factors, Workday, or Oracle. So some of those exist. Taking them to the next level is what's being worked on. Um, employees having a digital wallet where all of their skills and all of their um, knowledge about themselves is all, all housed in a digital wallet, just like you um, house your credit card to be able to, to, to pay. We will have that um, in the marketplace. We've already got pilots running around the world on that. So that's very soon. What I'd like to share in the last 10 seconds is that the future is actually now and those HR functions that embrace the future and embrace technology along with new operating models will be the will be have competitive advantage for the workforce and never before in the history of, of work has there been an ever increasing war for talent understanding talent and understanding work um, needs to happen now for those organizations that are going to survive I'll I'll, I'll 
finish there. Thank you very much for your time this morning. A pleasure to be with you. Um, and I look forward to hearing about your success and, uh, and hearing about how you're doing on your digital HR journey. Back over to you, Michael. Sorry, I would like to thank uh, everybody for participating today. And uh, since we are out of time, uh, any questions that came in will be answered offline. Uh, I have just posted the link to register to register to the rest of our series, which will be running at 11 a.m. every day this week. And uh, once again, thank thanks to our speakers. Very interesting stuff today. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you in our future webinars. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.